Well, thank you very much, Mike, for that very generous and kind introduction. And thank you all for inviting me to talk about Henry Clifton Sorby, who lived from 1826 to 1908, his life almost coinciding with that of Queen Victoria's. Why is it necessary, you may ask, for geologists to know about Sorby? You might pose the same question about any other historical topic or figure. Uh, knowing our history helps us understand and provides a meaningful sense of identity and very often inspires fresh ideas for new lines of research or inquiry. The publication of any research paper starts with a history of previous research that establishes the state of knowledge and the justification for the activity. It is a, a vital sense of orientation. Those of us who have taken a geoscience degree or related activity will typically have encountered the names of some early geological pioneers, perhaps Hutton, Lyle, or maybe Smith come to mind. Few, I venture, will have heard of the name Sorby, who perhaps may have been mentioned during courses on petrography. Remarkably, the name is seldom recognized in the academic world that Sorby was the pioneer of most of the scientific techniques that geologists use today, but now take for granted. He was the first to introduce experimental methods used in physics, maths and chemistry to geology. He called those quantitative methods. This approach in the mid 19th century was quite revolutionary. I believe he deserves greater recognition amongst especially those interested in earth science, but also those concerned with early Victorian history of scientific development. A golden age when a time when the relatively new science of geology was at the forefront of popular interest. My purpose in this talk is to tell you the story of the unique discoveries and ideas Henry Crifton Sorby developed in geology and why he was so different. I want to present reasons for this by describing his circumstances in Victorian England, the important impacts of the rapid industrialization and technological innovation in his hometown of Sheffield. The stimulus of the local geology on these developments, his education, family and friends and society. I aim to evaluate what Sorby achieved and suggest some reasons why he never received after his death the accolades from his peers, particularly during the first half of the 20th century, that his quite incredible achievements deserved in this country. And I want to contrast that with the recognition as a great scientist that he received overseas. His biographer, uh, Norman Hyam, wrote in 1963, outside Sheffield and outside geology and metallurgy, the name is little known. I first came across his name when my father, a metallurgist, taught me to use a microscope and how to make polished sections to examine steel and he commented that a Sheffield man called Sorby invented the technique. I initially thought little of this, but my interest in geology resulted in degree study at the Universities of Leicester and Sheffield, and I kept encountering the name in the context certainly of petrography, but also sedimentology, structural and metamorphic geology. Henry Clifton Sorby became a member of the YGS in 1940, uh, 1848, at a time when the county was home to some of the most influential figures in the early development of geological science. For example, Adam Sedgwick and John Phillips, and was where William Smith came to reside. Sorby was one of the first geologists to join the Yorkshire Geological Society, which at that time was called the West Riding Geological and Polytechnic Society, somewhat of a mouthful, along with some of his other family members and associates. And many of his early publications were reproduced in the proceedings of that society, which incidentally has the longest print run 
of any geo uh, publication in the geosciences. Sorby's work was so voluminous and so excellent that it wasn't matched until well into the 20th century, some 50 years after he finished public, uh, publishing. Sorby was the first geologist to decipher the origin of rocks through examination of thin sections with the polarizing microscope. In later classic papers, he founded structural petrology, sandstone petrography, and carbonate petrography. These papers remain indispensable reading to this day. Sorby also founded the systematic study of paleocurrents, fluvial sedimentation, and metallography. His life story is of one incredible accomplishment after another. I could add to that the other list of cosmology and spectroscopy, but I guess that would be boasting. In the next few slides, I want to look at a timeline and establish the principal scientific achievements to give you uh, an idea of the scope of what he accomplished in his 58 year career. Although the microscope had been used earlier to study fossils and uh, a few rocks, Sorby was the first geologist to really realize the importance of the technique. And he cut his first thin sections in um, 1848, 49 and 50. He presented his first paper in 1850 to the Yorkshire Geological Society and the Geological Society of London. Although this wasn't his first paper on microscopical on the uh, on microscopical structures. This was the first paper, the structure of the calcareous grit, a lower Cretaceous sandstone from sandstone that appeared in print in 1851. This was start of a, an amazing productive, productive decade when he discovered the mechanism behind the formation of metamorphic rocks with his papers on slated cleavage and schists, followed soon afterwards by work on melt and fluid inclusions. And at the end of the decade, he explained the origins of current bedding in rocks in terms of fluid dynamics and from the measurements of structures established the provenance of sandstones in the curl measures and Nemurian. In the following decade, Sorby demonstrated his thin section technique and work on crystals to Ferdinand Zekel in 1861 when he traveled to Germany and France with his mother. And thus between them laid the foundations of igneous petrography and petrology. He kept a lifelong correspondence and friendship with Zirkel, who was the professor of geology at Leipzig. Zirkel in turn introduced the techniques to North America and was in contact with Sorby throughout the rest of his life, attending his funeral in 1908 in Sheffield. Sorby's microscopical invest investigations developed in the direction of meteors and meteorites and made thin sections of the chondrites. He also devised methods for using incident light for the study of opaque minerals so that he could study the iron rich meteorites. These comprised making polished sections mounted on glass slides. He discovered that etching with concentrated nitric acid revealed their crystalline structure, then experimenting using different specimens of irons and steels that he discovered were crystalline materials too. His work with iron led him to invent the science of metallography and his discoveries underpinned the development of alloy steels, the heat treatment processes for the production of engineering steels and structural steels, which for example, allowed safer and higher running speeds on the expanding railway network during the 19th century. This knowledge supported the invention by Bessemer of the mass production of steel and the event eventual invention of stainless steel by Harry Braley. 
He also devised methods for making the first photomicrographs to illustrate the crisp, different crystalline structures of metals. He went on to invent the microspectroscope in 1865, an early sort of microprobe. By the 1870s, he started to receive recognition for some of his achievements. It was rather late in coming. He was the founding president of the Mineralogical Society. He was awarded the Royal Society's gold medal and became a well-known scientist. He was devoted to his mother, being an only child. And this seems to, following her death in 1874, coincide with a reduction uh, in his scientific research activities, partly also explained by his interest in other activities which were absorbing more of his time. He became president of the Geological Society and in his two presidential addresses in 1879 and 1880, presented the world's first classification of limestone and sandstone rocks. In later years, his life was more concerned with the endowment of scientific research with the Royal Society and the formation of a university for Sheffield, which he saw to completion. Many thought that his ideas had dried up after that time, but the best was yet to come with his paper on the application of quantitative methods, which was published in eight, eight, uh, 1908, which summarized all of his previous geological ideas and works. The question for me is, how did he do it? How did he do all of this? in splendid isolation. What was the role and influence of his family and friends? What were the conditions in Sheffield and why did he stay? What was the effect of the development of new microscope technologies and the emergence of local geological and scientific groups in Sheffield and Yorkshire? I'll start answering some of those questions by looking at his family circumstances in Sheffield. This map shows Sheffield in the 19th century and some of the important localities in the Sheffield area. Um, Henry Clifton Sorby's family were, his parents were Henry and his mother was uh, Amelia Nee Lambert who interestingly uh, came from London. The Sorby family had been prominent in Sheffield life and had been cutlers at least since the middle of the 17th century. The slide shows the uh, family home at Woodbourne, which is towards the east side of uh, Sheffield. And the town of Sheffield was developed at the confluence of the Sheaf and the Don. You can see the Don strikes a, a U-shaped arc following my um, pointer there, and the sheaf runs in a north-south direction, rising in the Derbyshire hills and flowing northwards, and Sheffield is uh, formed at that confluence. The town's uh, location really is, uh, the, the confluence is responsible for the uh, location of the, t of the town, which is a, on a defensive site, and a very large castle was constructed in the middle of Sheffield, which was uh, destroyed at the end of the Civil War. A consequence of Sheffield's uh, geographical position is that there is high moorland both to the west of the city and also to the south, meaning that it was a rather isolated loca location. Indeed, because of its difficult topographic situation, the Midland Railway didn't come to Sheffield until 1870. The Sorbys lived at Woodbourne Hall, near Attercliffe to the east of Sheffield, and his father, Henry Sorby, was one of nine brothers and two sisters. Henry Clifton Sorby was born at Woodbourne Hall in 1826, and he was the only child of Henry and Amelia. 
His uncle, John Francis, was married to another Amelia, uh, who married a man called Hartop, who was the largest owner of ironworks in Yorkshire and a founding and influential member of the Yorkshire Geological Society, which was formed in Wakefield in 1837. And he would have had a significant influence over his nephew, Henry Clifton Sorby. Sorby would have been also exposed mainly to the business interests of the large Sorby family, who were associated with the manufacture of steel and edge tools. I conclude that he would have probably lived in a Victorian introspective environment as an only child. His mother, Amelia Lambert, being born in London, was probably his only so source of social contact. He would have been exposed to the extensive business interests of the Sorby family, uh, who were also owners of a large land estate to the southeast of Sheffield called Orgreave. The Sorby tool business was intimately associated with a liveried company, one of the few outside London known as the Company of Cutlers in Sheffield and Hallamshire. This organisation, established by Act of Parliament in the 17th century, shortly after the Civil War, regulates the cutlery trades and it includes the registering of each cutler's trademarks for uh, maintaining the Made in Sheffield insignia known throughout the world as a symbol of craftsmanship and quality. Its coat of arms and the Cutlass Hall is illustrated above. The Sorby family provided the first master cutler, a person elected for two years at the head of the organisation. The annual Cutlass Feast is still held in a magnificent hall in Sheffield, which is now run as a charity. The Sorbys have been cutlers in Sheffield for over 350 years. Robert Sorby and Sons is still trading today and world famous for manufacturing the very best quality wood turning tools. I believe that are now also associated with the well-known Spear and Jackson brand. Some of their registra registration trademarks, which are, are rather amusing, are shown in this slide one showing the location of the business in the middle of Sheffield in Carver Street with the kangaroo trademark indicating the growing importance of trade with uh, Australasia and the manufacturing items would also be signed with the Maltese cross the Robert Sorby uh, insignia ensuring that the purchaser had acquired the genuine article Henry Clifton Sorby's father had a 50% share of this business which seemed to have operated from a variety of premises in Sheffield. The sighting of Sheffield at the confluence of five fast flowing rivers, seven hills as in Rome and five valleys, Don, Rivlin, Loxley, Porter and Sheaf, provided the natural resources for the development of industry. These rivers utilized until the early 20th century the intensive development of water power. There are some 30 miles of rivers that flow around the city area and the water wheels occurred at a density of about four per mile. Each wheel was producing in the region of 10 horsepower. My records of the list of water wheels for the 18th and 19th century in Sheffield show that the Sorbys held leases of these mills primarily on the Rivlin during the 19th century. The development of steam power fueled by uh, coal rapidly replaced water wheels and led to the rise in demand for fuel and widespread exploitation of the abundant coal resources present beneath Sheffield. By the mid 19th century, this form of power had largely replaced water power. The good bituminous coal at shallow depths beneath Sheffield, notably the Silkston seam, which was up to two metres thick. And you can see in the north here where the Silkston rock is, which lies uh, uh, over the top of the Silkston seam. So it gives you an indication of how close the uh, uh, outcrop of the coal was to the centre of Sheffield. And above that, 
the uh, thicker bars they see. And both of these were very advantageous for further industrial development. Henry Sorby, Henry Clifton Sorby's fa father, owned the Orgreave Hall and the surrounding lands and had the capital to exploit these coal seam resources that could be accessed from his land. To further illustrate the point, let's have a look at some of the geology surrounding Sheffield. This slide shows the latest revision of Sheet 100, the Sheff Sheffield, published by the BGS. And this is the, uh, the, the bedrock edition, showing the whole of the area is underlain by the lower and upper coal measures, which are marked there in the different colours of grey. The sequences are dominated by mudstones and siltstones, with numerous coal seams and thick intervening fluviatile sandstones. And you can see the lenticular art, uh, architecture of these sandstone beds from the uh, green uh, coloured outcrops on the map. The thicker sandstones are often specifically named, for example, as we've come across already, the Silkston Rock and other important names are the Greenmoor Rock and Crowshaw Sandstone. The outcrop reflects the pattern of the Great Don Monocline, uh, which you can see on the map which I marked here. Uh, an inversion Caledonian basement structure that has displaced the uh, coal measures quite dramatically. The Silkston coal, about two metres thick, underlies most of the eastern part of Sheffield at relatively shallow depths. The thick Silkston rock, whose outcrop was highlighted in the previous illustration at Neep's End, was an important source also for the production of grindstones as well as building materials. The approximate crop of the two best seams is shown here, the Silkstone and the Barnsley coal seam. And of course, Henry Sorby's estate was situated rather advantageously at Orgreave, so he could ex uh, mine and exploit both of those seams. In this slide, the details of the Orgreave estate uh, can be more readily seen. And I've marked on here some of the mines that developed during the 19th century. Orgreave Hall and its associated mines and the other coal mines in the area uh, were well served by the newly constructed Manchester Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway, which is M, M, S and L, marked in red. Not easily seen on that map is the presence of the River Rother, which flowed through Sorby's Orgreave Estate. Uh, and I've also marked on the local sandstone quarries, which um, uh, were the source of building materials and also used for the sharpening stones for the cutlery trades. It's interesting to see what the influence of these geological features was on Sorby. And I quote from his 1897 address to the Sheffield Literary and Philosophical Society. He recalled the influence of the landscape features surrounding Orgreave. My next proceeding was to study the alluvial deposits in the neighborhood of Sheffield. And I prepared maps of the Valley of the Don and the Rother showing the general character of the alluvial tract and the evidence of the wandering about of the rivers times gone by. My attention had been directed to these valleys in various ways. I was residing at Woodbourne near to the Don that was intimately connected with the Rother for the broadest tract was my own property being part of the Orgreave Hall estate. At about the same date and walking from Woodbourne to Orgreave, I was caught in a shower of rain and while sheltering in a quarry near Handsworth, my attention was attracted by what afterwards I called current structures, namely structures produced in stratified rocks by the action of the currents present during the time of formation. In order to further his interest, Sorby constructed apparatus, which we would now know as flumes, in the river rather, and measured the flow 
and the rate of deposition of the rivers themselves. No one before Sorby had ever dreamt of measuring exactly the geological processes that work now with a view to drawing conclusions about the remote past. The Sorby's Orgreave estate contained large coal resources and the earliest mining commenced in 1795 working the Barnsley seam and the second shaft was sunk in 1851 followed by deepening to the sil silts and seam. My inquiries have found that if you look on the list of coal mines in 1869 and 70, uh, Mrs Sorby was listed as the owner until 1870. Shortly after this time the mine was sold for £300,000 to the Rothervale group of collieries via another organisation called the Fence Colliery Company that eventually came under the control of the United Steel Company of Sheffield. I asked why is this significant? Well, Henry Clifton Sorby's biographer and many other accounts have suggested that his wealth which he used to pursue his scientific interests, came simply by selling his shares inherited from his father's steel making business, which I would venture was a fairly small undertaking, probably not enough to keep you uh, well fed for a 60 year period of scientific research. This evidence reveals that his mother owned a large coal mining undertaking at Orgreave, and at present day values, I estimate that the sale proceeds would have been worth between 25 and 30 million pounds. Quite a tidy sum. The name Orgreave may be familiar to some of you. For a bit of background, here's a picture of Orgreave Colliery in the late 19th century. And you may observe that sadly, its history has been frequently associated with violence. So the picture emerges of growing wealth amongst those with capital invested in Sheffield and the Sorby family, who were amongst those who would have profited and benefited from its growth and success. Henry and Amelia Sorby had sufficient income to have their only son privately educated and he attended the Anglican Collegiate School in Sheffield. In 1841, at the age of 15, the Sorbys were wealthy enough to engage a private tutor, the Reverend Walter Mitchell. And for the next four years, he was curate also at the St John's Church in Attercliffe, as well as teaching their son. Mitchell was a Cambridge educated scientist and after his time in Sheffield, became the vicar of St. St. Bartholomew's of Less in London. Henry Clifton saw his interests were in science and in particular chemistry, probably reflecting his tutor Mitchell's main interests. Sorby's father had a laboratory built in order to further his education and it was fully equipped and located at this rather attractive hall at Orgreave. The Sorbys and their family with their interest in steel appear to have also had interests in the acquisition of knowledge. And Henry Clifton Sorby had relatives who were active in the West Riding Geological and Polytechnic Society, who from 1838 regularly held meetings in Sheffield. They were also prominent figures in the Literary and Philosophical Society and Henry Clifton Sorby joined both groups in 1842 and 1849 respectively. To further advance his education, particularly in the direction of science, Sorby received tuition from William Fochlander, the Master of German at Sheffield Collegiate College. The reason behind this was Germany was regarded as the powerhouse of scientific innovation at the time. And in order for their son to access and receive uh, the best education in science, it was important for him to be a fluent German speaker. 
During the mid 1980s, an interesting diary of Henry Clifton Sorby's father uh, was discovered by accident. Whilst this only covered some 12 months prior to his father's death in 1846, it reveals how the transference of Henry Clifton's interest from chemistry to geology and microscopy came about. Plans were being developed for Sorby to study chemistry under the tutelage of Justus von Liebig at Gießen University in Germany and also geology under Professor John Phillips in Dublin. In February 1846, his family arranged a 12 week long holiday to London and the South Coast, where Sorby was to be introduced to some of the leading scientific figures and also to combine that with visiting family members in the South of England. It appears that during Sorby's visits to the London museums and afterwards collecting specimens himself from the South Coast, that his interests in geology overtook those in chemistry. His father, who ha having suffered an accident prior to his holiday, went into decline and died in October 1846, leaving his 50% interest in his business of steel manufacturing uh, to his son and the property to his wife, Amelia. Henry Clifton was only 20 years old and he declared after the death of his father that he wished to pursue a career as a geologist and scientist. As an only son, he dedicated his life to the care of his mother and they lived together until she died in 1874. He had a substantial inheritance via his father and later an even greater amount from the sale of his mother's coal mine. He was financially very wealthy and had the support of his mother to pursue his career as a gentleman scientist. Sorby was not only fortunate in having substantial financial resources and family support, he lived at a time when Britain was the world leader in the development of microscopes and microscope lenses. Sorby had met Nicol, the inventor of the Nicol prisms in Edinburgh, and was familiar with the application of polarised light. The Sorbys would also have encountered demonstrations of microscopy, particularly when visiting lecturers came to the Sheffield Lit and Phil Society meetings. The microscope had become an interesting instrument which aroused great curiosity, finding increasing use in research and was being widely used by amateurs. Correspondence survives between uh, Sorby and James Naismith, the Manchester inventor of the steam powered hammer. And their correspondence was about the microscopical structure of carbon in coke. And Henry Clifton Sorby published a paper in the uh, Proceedings of the West Yorkshire Geological and Polytechnic Society on the existence of four crystalline species of carbon in 1850. Sorby's first microscope, which I, I believe is likely to have been uh, captured in this photograph on the left hand side, is the only image that we have surviving of him with a microscope. He's recorded in the sales ledger of the makers Smith and Beck of Coleman Street, London, as acquiring this instrument on the 28th of April 1848, and it was called the Best Smaller Model. Some two years later, after his 1846 visit with his parents to London, the photograph of him posed with the instrument may be the only image of Sorby with his first Beck and Smith microscope. However, if you look at close inspection of the microscope and compare it with a museum specimen of the same design, it appears not quite to accord with the contemporary illustrations and the microscope limbs on the museum specimen on the right hand side have what's called a Jackson type of uh, limb which is curved and the one on the left hand side I think even though the photograph resolution isn't very very good is clearly a straight a straight um, 
as a limb. Unfortunately, this early microscope with which he used was traded in part exchange for a large binocular type, which I'll show you shortly. And neither of these instruments appears to have survived. This shows the catalog that Sorby would have been uh, reading for his microscopes. And we know from the Smith and Beck catalog that nickel prisms were supplied. The objective lenses that were available comprised the achromatic type, which were made by J.J. Lister for Smith and Beck. Uh, Lister was a Quaker and another famous and important Yorkshire scientist. He was mostly interested in natural history and he came to realize that the available microscopes back then didn't deliver the best results and he believed that they were not able to adequately resolve um, and reveal the structures of plant cells for example and animal cells in sufficient detail. Thus Lister began to design and build achromatic lenses. An achromat is a lens that is designed to limit the effects of chromatic and spherical aberration. Achromatic lenses are corrected by bringing two wavelengths, typically the red and the blue, into focus on the same plane. Lister combined lenses of two different types of glass, crown glass and flint glass. Both of these had different dispersion characteristics. And by doing that, they both cancelled out the chromatic aberration. Lister was able to demonstrate the, that spherical aberration could be minimised by the correct separation of the lens combinations, which led to the perfection of the optical microscope. Lister worked with Smith and Beck, who were the, at the time, world leaders in microscope design and produced a microscope with the greatest resolving power. These were expensive and not widely used because the cheaper sorts of microscopes were perfectly adequate for resolving the majority of subjects that were being investigated. The next slide very simply illustrates that point. This is a, a diagram showing uh, an achromat with the two types of crown glass and flint glass uh, in the different colours of shading. It also shows the light paths diagrammatically. When visible white light passes through a lens, some tends to be separated into the constituent wavelengths, i.e. red through to blue, and this is what is known as dispersion. This effect reduces the resolving powers of the lenses by causing chromatic aberration. The diagram here is illustrating an achromat doublet lens, which brings the red long wavelength and blue light short wavelength to the same focus point and overcomes the def defect. Solby had been taught optics by the Reverend Walter Mitchell, and clearly he recognised the benefits of using Lister's lenses. With this apparatus which he purchased, he refers in his diary to being able to resolve particle sizes measuring from one ten thousandth of an inch to one hundred thousandth of an inch. The highest aperture, the numerical aperture attainable for a non-achromatic lens is about 0.3 corresponding to a maximum resolving power of only one thirty thousandth of an inch. So now what he needed to know next was how to exploit the resolving power of the achromatic microscope by devising a method of cutting and grinding thin slices of rocks. Continuing the theme of looking at his microscopes, his later studies were carried out using a further improved instrument manufactured again by Smith and Beck. Fortunately, they left behind their delivery book records. So we know that Sorby received the large best microscope, serial number 2484 in 1861. And this was the time that he commenced his study into meteorites 
where he required the capability of working with both transmitted and incident light. The best large model of these has those facilities and the following sequence, which I'll very quickly go through, gives you an indication of the quality and the range of options that were available for this type of microscope. You will notice in this particular um, uh, tube design, there is a, a binocular facility available using what's known as a Wenham prism. And the two uh, tubes have interpupillary adjustment for more comfortable viewing. The circular rotating petrological stage is illustrated here with a 360 degree graduated chapter ring. The substage can accommodate the interchange of condenser lenses and uh, interchange are interchangeable and adjustable as well as having access for nickel prisms. The arrangements for the petrological stage are seen in this image with provision for holding square glass sides. The chapter ring, which is probably a little clearer here, is used to measure the extinction angles in polarized light. A problem Sorby encountered when looking at opaque minerals in thin section arose because light cannot pass through opaque specimens. This was initially overcome by using incident light that is illumination from above the microscope stage. This was difficult to control and did not provide the critical illumination required for detailed observation. To Sorby's good fortune, Richard Beck invented an incident illumination device shown here in 1866. This relied on a pencil of light being directed through the microscope tube and reflected through a rotatable glass acting as a prism by means of total internal reflection. The objective glass of the microscope acting as a condenser. I move on to look at the next stage of Sorby's development, that is specimen preparation. Sorby's 1850 paper, which was published in uh, 1851, when Sorby was only 24, represents the results of the first microscopic study of rocks by means of thin sections. Sorby learnt how to make thin sections from W.C. Williamson in the mid-1840s, who was a surgeon and the grandson of a lapidary. Williamson later became a well-known paleobotanist. The techniques that have been attributed uh, for making thin sections came about uh, via an Edinburgh group comprising uh, George Sanderson, David Brewster and the better known William Nicol, which at the beginning of the 19th century had started to uh, look at um, making sections of, uh, of minerals. It was Nickel, of course, who invented the nickel prism that forms the basis of the polling apparatus fitted to petrological microscopes. Sorby didn't invent the method of making thin sections. Sorby refined these techniques to produce the standardized section of rocks, all of which he made to about 30 microns thick by using brass or tin shims to maintain a uniform constant thickness dimension. It's interesting to see here that he always used square shaped slides, which were about 40 millimeters square and mounted with Canada balsam adhesive and square cover glasses. Sorby was very careful in curation of his specimens. This is a, one of the original Sorby slide boxes held in the University of Sheffield. They have a collection of well over a thousand examples of his uh, collection of slides. Coming back to looking at his first investigations, the geological map of Yorkshire shows the uh, locus of that investigation at Scarborough, looking at the calcareous grit, sand, which is a sandstone, a calcareous sandstone, outcropping beneath Scarborough Castle, 
situated in the north part of the town. Sorby always inscribed his slides with a diamond tip stylus, adding the location, date, short description and initials. This slide here, one of the first ever made, is more than 170 years old and I think remains in remarkable condition. And thanks to his foresight of inscribing it with a diamond tipped stylus, um, other makers would have used paper la uh, labels which have long since disappeared and rotted away. Using a polarised microscope with a rotating stage, Sorby determined the properties by which he could recognise the various minerals present in his thin sections, which initiated the study of microscopic petrography. Furthermore, he developed a method of point counting to produce a quantitative estimate of the composition of these rocks. And these techniques are still in use today. This is one of the illustrations from his first paper, which appears simultaneously in the Proceedings of the West Riding Geological and Polytechnic Society, and that was read at the Sheffield meeting, uh, as you will see from the detail on the right hand side of the slide. The illustrations on the left hand side, some of you will recognise uh, some of the quartz fragments here with the various levels of extinction present. And these illustrations represent the first illustrations ever published of microscopic sedimentary petrography. Sorby in 1853 and 18. 56 started working on metamorphic rocks. Some of his early introduction to the subject of uh, metamorphic rocks took place when he visited the Malvern Hills with Adam Sedgwick. He moved on from there and noticed that the green spots in Cambrian age purple slates collected at Penryn, Athlanberis in North Wales appeared to be ellipsoidal and flattened in the plane of cleavage, whereas rocks without a cleavage, the spots tended to be spherical or flattened in the plane of bedding. Sorby measured the axial ratios of these elliptical sections through some 200 spots in the plane of cleavage and perpendicular to the cleavage, including the longest dimension of the cleavage, and he found mean values for those ratios to be 1.6 to 1 and 3.73 to 1 respectively. He found evidence of slaty cleavage being associated with a bulk flattening of the rock from examination of Devonian slates of Devon, uh, which is illustrated on the right hand side of the slide. You'll note the buckled sandy beds. By introducing the microscope into geology as an instrument of petrographic research, Sorby was able to make microscopical examination of the slates he found in the Cambrian slates of North Wales to be composed of minute mica flakes, approximately um, a tenth of an inch in maximum length and um, 0.1 uh, of an inch thick with a very pronounced orientation so that on average their short dimensions were perpendicular to the cleavage planes. Flat fragments of crinoids and corals were also found to have a similar geometric relationship in slaty cleavage in the limestones of Devon. Having seen undeformed rocks of similar lithology without the preferred orientation, Sorby concluded that during deformation, the flat particles tended to align themselves perpendicular to the compression direction and the linear fragments aligned themselves along the expansion direction, giving the rocks a definite grain in the cleavage planes. He went on to undertake experiments with clay mixtures that proved the observations that he was making with his microscope. Sorby and later Bonney in 1884 recognised the importance of the processes of solution, migration and recrystallisation, i.e. 
pressure solution transfer has a factor in the deformation of rocks on the scale of both individual grains and folds. Subsequently, these mechanisms have been considered in great detail, both theoretically and experimentally, and there seems little doubt that the constituent grains and fragments in rocks may change their shapes and orientations during deformation. It wasn't until the 1960s that scientists such as Ramsey, Dunnett and Elliot approved that what Sorby was saying was correct. That slaty cleavage in a rock is due to geometric alignment of its constituent part particles, plating minerals and flattened grains being orientated parallel to the cleavage planes. It has been confirmed time and time again since Sorby introduced the microscope into geology as an instrument of petrographic research. His early work on petrography failed to make the impact that one might have expected. And it was a similar story with his work on the calcareous grit in Yorkshire. The Swiss geologist Saussure laughed at his proposals to use the microscope to look into the problem. He said it was not proper to examine mountains with a microscope. Sir Henry de la Beche, then director of the Geological Sur Survey, told him, you're working at slaty cleavage. You've no business to do that. We've settled the question in the survey in this place thoroughly, and you have no business to go into it anymore. Not very kind treatment for an amateur. Upon publication of his paper, he was regarded it was regarded as a triumph by his peers and his reputation thereafter firmly established. As for de la Beche, I will not comment. Moving on to sedimentology. In papers dating from 1850, Sorby pioneered the descriptive and hydrodynamic study of sedimentary structures, together with their application to paleocurrent and paleogeographical analysis, the latter topic having received no general synthesis until another century had passed. Sorby published his first paper in 1852, again in the Proceedings of the West Yorkshire Geological and Polytechnic Society, entitled On the Oscillation of the Currents Drifting the Sandstone Beds to the Southeast of Northumberland and their general direction in the coal field in the neighbourhood of Edinburgh. He published further evidence in his presidential address to the Geological Society and also in his final work on quantitative studies published in 1908. He carried out a series of rigorous observations of the current structures using both modern and ancient deposits. He carefully measured data on frequency as well as on direction and the experimental studies on the mechanics of formation of the current structures. He had in mind that the ultimate use of this data was a means of reconstructing physical geographies of the varied stratigraphical intervals although he referred to these data as ultimately to be expressed as an atlas, presumably a paleogeographical map. He never presented this information in that form. Sorby emphasised the dynamic aspects of current direction in his reconstructions, and it may be that the complexities of depicting such patterns deterred him. He carefully studied modern time uh, tide tables wind data, sailing directions, in order to understand modern circulation patterns of nearby coastal areas. This experience he used to reconstruct the conditions of the position of such horizons as the coal measure sandstones. He recognised the development of primary structures in the magnesium limestone, and on the base of these structures interpreted the environment of deposition of the limestone. Sorby's studies of ancient current structures form an exemplary model of the mythology, methodology of science in his early studies of them, 
recognising their importance in recalling the directions of sedimentary transport. He began collecting observations by which the end, in the end of his career totaled over 20,000, ranging stratigraphically from the old red sandstone to modern deposits, geographically spread to Scotland and to Weald in South East England. The stream studies he supported by laboratory studies, ranging from the measurement of settling velocities to the design of apparatus to stimulate the development of certain types of cross bedding. In these demonstrations, he used natural sand and emery to emphasize the structures formed. His apparatus were successful, sufficiently successful to warrant the construction of several others for sale. The observations on his home ground were rather complemented by the studies of the structures of the deposits of the nearby rivers and coasts until he could determine with confidence the pattern of structure formed by oscillating waves, tides and currents. I'm just looking at my watch and thinking it is half past eight and I think perhaps I will need to move on to some conclusions fairly quickly. Would that be, if I could speak through to the chairman, uh, uh, agreeable? Y yes, that's fine. Uh, well, no, well, I mean, I, I, have, I have more to say, but I, I think in view of the hour, um, I, I perhaps ought to um, move through the slides a little further. Yes, OK, yes, take us. Uh, Would you like me to um, yes. conclude or, or I, I have another few bits to say, but... Run, run us briefly through what else you have to say okay. and reach a conclusion. Thank you, Noel. We, we um, actually have no, uh, we have no questions at the moment, so if you do go on a bit longer, it'll be fine. Thank, thank you. I, I'll try and speed up. We, uh, we're up to carbonates. Sorby's presidential address of 1879 on the structure and origin of limestones was essentially an interim report of his research in progress. His petrographic approach to limestones stemming from three decades of research and he laid the foundations for a wide range of further research lines, some of which were not fully exploited for almost a century, such as fluid inclusion studies in diagenesis. It's a familiar theme coming out here, isn't there? The significance of many of his discoveries, for example, that some Jurassic ooids and Paleozoic corals were originally calcitic, had geochemical implications that have only recently achieved research prominence. For example, the effect of carbon dioxide and the greenhouse earth. In addition, Sorby's legacy was the example of his peerless approach to research. He applied ruthless empiricism to the problem at hand. In the case of limestones, this involved the application of meticulous descriptive petrography, innovative experimentation, his approach to understand more fully the complex problems posed by carbonates remains unsurpassed, involving a thorough integration of detailed observation, imaginative thinking, and the judicious use of anal analytical techniques. Robert Falk, the famous carbonate petrographer, regarded reading Sorby's 1879 address on limestones to the Geological Society, almost like reading the Bible. I'll move through the next two sections. In this slide, I show an example of how Sorby's work on carbonates continues to be relevant. This paper published in 2019 states, since the discovery that coccoliths are of biological origin, Sorby 1861, the general understanding of coccolithophores has substantially increased. Coccolithophores occupy an important role in carbon cycling dynamics over short and long geological timescales due to the process of calcification fueled by photosynthetic energy. It was not until the examination of the chalk, Sorby having discussed that 
coccoliths were a significant component in the makeup of chalk, that using an electron microscope in the 1960s that Sorby's controversial observations about coccolithospheres were proven to be correct. Uh, Sorby also devised a microspectroscope. Uh, this ingenious prism and microscope attachment um, was devised to measure the absorption spectrum characteristic of rare earth elements. He did this because he was anxious to try and discover new elements. Uh, it's one of the areas that he wasn't particularly successful about. Uh, however, it, it is finding widespread use in distinguishing semi-precious gems from other similarly colored natural synthetic materials. Sorby actually gave evidence, um, forensic evidence, because Sorby was able to use the microscope to identify um, uh, microscopic particles of human blood. And at a murder trial, he was called to give evidence where he used his microspectroscope to identify uh, the location of human blood. In eighteen, in the eighteen late eighteen fifties and early eighteen sixties, his interest moved towards looking at uh, meteorites, and this is a slide that he constructed of the uh, Meso Madras uh, meteorite, which is a, a, a chondrite eat, uh, meteorite that fell in Romania in. 1852. I don't think he made the slide till later in the 1850s and he published in 1877 and I can think of nothing better than um, to read Professor Granville Turner's um, account of his findings. Turner is the all emeritus professor of isotope geochemistry and had of the Cosmo Chemistry Research Group at the University of Manchester. In Sorby's earliest two-page account of meteorites in 1864, he refers to almost all the main features we now recognize, basalt-like interlocking crystals, uh, achondrites, glass inclusions, in olivine melt inclusions, fragmental structures, brecciated meteorites, and globules with radiating crystal boundaries. Read any popular account of meteorites and you will see the reference to his 1877 description of chondrules, which he called drops of fiery rain. Major technical advances such as the electron microprobe and high precision mass spectrometry and the added interest in the evolution of the solar system associated with the return of rocks from the surface of the moon led to a reinvigoration of meteorite research. Fluid inclusions in meteoritic halite have been dated and testified to the early presence of liquid water beyond anything uh, Sorby could have imagined as being the discovery of pre-solar grains, minute nanodiamonds and silicon carbide grains which formed in the envelope of distant stars and were somehow incorporated into the solar nebula without being destroyed, something Sorby would have appreciated had been the discovery of meteorites ejected from the surface of the moon and Mars. Surprisingly, one of the still unanswered questions is the origin of chondrules. In spite of long arguments and many hundreds of publications, we still can do no better than Sorby's descriptions. I'll move on. I think his work on fluid inclusions was one of his masterpieces. Fluid inclusions are, were considered curios curiosities until Sorby set about them with his microscope. And he published in 1858, the findings on the microscopic structure of crystals, indicating the origin of minerals and rocks in the quarterly journal of the Geological Society. For those 
who may not be aware of inclusions, this slide shows some photomicrographs taken from a paper by Edwin Roda, the American geologist, who rediscovered Sorby's work in the late 1950s. And uh, I'll not go through the details here, but effectively it shows you the three types uh, typical of inclusions. Um, I'll move on rather quickly. Hold that image in your mind and I'll show you on the right hand side the drawings that Sorby made of the inclusions that he was observing in crystals. Quite remarkable that uh, Rhoda uh, rediscovered what Sorby had um, already described. Sorby was the pioneer of the use of microscopes to examine rocks and he was the first to describe inclusions from a scientific perspective and he used them to determine the temperature and pressure at the time that igneous and metamorphic rocks were formed. I think that's quite startling. The diversity of fluid inclusion applications today is highlighted as by the investigations of microbial life on Earth and Mars using biosignatures. These are trapped in evaporite minerals, also known as Martian analogues, forming halite and gypsum. Furthermore, innovative analytical techniques, for example, microbeam technologies, have greatly assisted in the advancement of fluid inclusion study methodology. As I may have said before, the pioneering that work that Sorby did on these materials was not taken up until the late 1950s in the United States and also in the Eastern Bloc countries. After the death of his mother in 1874, Sorby received widespread recognition as an internationally eminent geologist and scientist and he was president of the Geological Society founding president of the MINSOC, and he was made fellow of the Royal Society and an honorary LLD from the University of Cambridge. His days of pioneering research were largely over and his fame, energy and influence were directed to providing higher education facilities in his hometown. He became the president of the Firth College in 1882 and whose motto is carried over the university coat of arms and the scroll reads translated to discover the causes of things, a quote from Virgil. The eight arrows on there representing the ancient symbol of Sheffield. Sorby became a JP and served as president of the, of the Literal and Philosophical Society in Sheffield. In his older times, possibly his retirement, he took up a ledger pursuit and his scientific interests moved towards the life sciences. He bought a yawl, a large yacht called the Glimpse that he used to sail with a crew of five up and down the east coast investigating particularly the Thames F estuary and he gave evidence to the Royal Commission on the Thames about pollution and he published papers um, and showing the techniques that he used to mount some of the animals that he collected on his journeys for examination under the microscope. His knowledge was quite critical in determining the design of the sewage treatment system, which London um, uh, instituted under the direction of the engineer Bazalgett. Much time and energy was absorbed in work associated with the establishment of the University of Sheffield, which was formed by the amalgamation of the Medical School, Firth College and Technical School. These arrangements were put in place by 1897, which was the Jubilee year of Queen Victoria when she came to Sheffield to make it a city. Sorby had been informally approached at that stage for the award of a knighthood. He was the obvious candidate to become the first chancellor of the university. However, he was an introvert and he wasn't a big name in Sheffield, despite his work in metallurgy being of the utmost importance to its prosperity. And Henry Fitzalan Howard, the 15th Duke of Devonshire, stepped in. 
he was also conveniently mayor of Sheffield and with historical ties to the area. Nevertheless, he endowed the university with funding for a chair in geology and also the Royal Society Research Fund. And one of the outcomes of that research fund was uh, the Nobel Prize awarded to Hans Kreb for his critical work in the citric acid cycle in biology. Sorby died in his sleep at home in March 1908, his funeral being held in the Hecklesaw Parish Church where he was buried alongside his mother. Some of the remarks made at the time of his passing are telling. Professor Arnold, the professor of metallurgy at the university said, Dr. Sorby was not a family man. And though in easy circumstances, he laboriously devoted his life to scientific research. The fact that those services to science were never adequately rewarded remains a permanent disgrace to the powers that be. Solace, who was president of the Geological Society in the year after Sorby's death in 1909, drew analogy between Sorby and Faraday, noting that both these great men published their first scientific contributions on the analysis of a piece of lime. Recognition of Sorby's greatness came about in the 1960s, firstly with the award um, by Professor W. Jean Fernsides of the uh, uh, Sorby Medal by the Yorkshire Geological Society, and also at a similar time by the International Metallographic Society, which is based in the United States, which is the society's highest award presented annually in recognition of achievement in the field of metallography. The Sorby Medal is also the highest award of the International Association of Sedimentologists and is awarded to scientists of eminent distinction in sedimentology once every four years on the occasion of the International Sedimentological Congress. Amongst its distinguished recipients are R.L. Falk, R.G. Bathurst and particularly nice J.R.L. Allen, who was a Sheffield alumnus. Finally, Dorsa Sorby. Dorsa Sorby is a wrinkle ridge system in the Mare Seringitatis on the moon, a 76 meter long, 76 kilometer long feature named after Henry Clifton Sorby by, by NASA in recognition of his greatness and contribution to science. These features of other British scientists, similar features uh, are named after Darwin and Lyle. It's remarkable that his discoveries are still highly relevant and his publications continue to be frequently cited. Norman Hyam, his biographer and who was the author of A Very Scientific Gentleman, published in 1963, judged him to have been an eminent scientist. C.S. Smith from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and who wrote the history of metallography in the forward to this account commented on his, his greatness. After Hyam's biography was written in the 1960, Sorby's geological achievements in the latter part of the last millennium have undergone a reprise. No such reappraisal was necessary in metallography. The earth sciences during the 1960s advanced by greater use of quantitative methods aided by the accessibility of analytical equipment and techniques based on the great advances in digital and electronic devices. Computer developments permitted modeling of complex data sets and widespread use of numerical and statistical methods. North America led the way in the earth sciences and it is they who have rediscovered and recognized Sorbet's achievements of laying the foundations, the pioneer of these quantitative methods as the principal tools of geological discovery. So what does this tell us about Sorbery? His achievements over a 58 year career were truly remarkable. 
He was a very well wealthy gentleman. He worked in isolation and he would today be considered an amateur. Perhaps this status may explain why after his death, his work was never followed up by others in the UK. And it took another 60 or more years for geologists, largely based in North America and elsewhere overseas to rediscover his work. I suggest that perhaps the overriding reason was his failure to cultivate an association with the London elite and his insistence in remaining resident in an unfashionable city. And secondly, to transfer, the failure to transfer and develop other scientists to take over his work. Sheffield's greatest scientist? Probably, because he recognised that iron and steel were crystalline materials and he unlocked the secret of the production of alloy steels, which is one of the greatest benefits that society has received. Thank you very much for listening.